I'm also a PhD candidate at Stanford. Along the way, you guys see everything okay? Okay. Um, where I study consumer behavior, and a lot of the work I've done has to do with consumer identity. So that's a little bit of what I'll be talking about today. And. My goals for today are less so to have you walk away with specific information about these studies and what, what the studies found, and more so to kind of get a sense of how we do research and the approach we take to research, and hopefully you can translate that to your own companies. And one of the things I hope that you notice is that a lot of the results we'll be talking about that people find in these studies, they seem really obvious. And I urge you to consider the fact that they only seem obvious after the fact, after you've done them as is the case with many of our intuitions. And in fact, this whole field of consumer behavior was in fact built on counterintuitive findings. Um, so with that in mind, I hope that you consider the fact that your own intuitions in your companies might, be, might not be true and to always test those. So always approach everything with a hypothesis-driven approach. I think that is the big distinction uh, in consumer research is that everything is approached with a hypothesis. Just like you, we have intuitions. Those intuitions are always tested. So we'll talk a little bit about a hypothesis-driven approach to looking at the data that you have, and of course, testing. I'm sure you've heard this a million times. I'm here to advocate for it a million first time. Uh, so with that, um, a little bit about identity and why it matters in consumer context. Uh, I know a lot of times identity is sort of thought about as this sort of really internal thing. It's your values, it's what you stand for. But in fact, it's been proposed that the possessions we have or things we own reflect a lot on ourselves and we use them to sort of convey information about who we are, what we stand for, uh, who we'd like to be. And I think some of these examples are really obvious, right? If you're like walking down the street, you see someone wearing a t-shirt, band t-shirt and torn jeans, you're going to get a different impression from them than if they're wearing bonobos, bonobos and like a collar shirt, right? You're just getting different information from them. So this is sort of like how we use products to convey who we are. We can also can use products to convey who we want to be, so more like aspirational types of things. So a um, good example of that is uh, luxury, luxury cars, right? A lot of times they'll have entry-level models, and that's sort of to get people in the door of this aspiration of who they want to be. And these sorts of things are important for identity because generally we like to have a feeling that we are sort of a consistent, unique being. Uh, we act consistently through time, Identity is a great way to have a sense of who you are now, who you want to be. It's a way to self-evaluate. It's a way to self-improve. Um, and the other interesting thing about this is not only do we want to have sort of positive attributions about ourselves, we want those attributions to be distinctive, right? So if we're in a room and we all have the same positive attribute and all of those attributes are the same, that doesn't really say a whole lot about us. So there's this drive to be unique and distinctive. And this is often really obvious in the way people describe themselves. So in contexts, like a work context, I might focus on describing myself in terms of my athletic abilities. In an athletic context, I might sort of describe myself in terms of my work abilities. And all that to sort of distinguish yourself from the group that you're in. And even uh, the sorts of descriptions that people give to others, people find certain descriptions a lot more informative or descriptive of a person, right? So if I were to tell you that my friend is a snake owner, that probably gives you a bit more information than if I said my friend's a dog owner, right? So things that are distinctive tend to convey a lot more information about who we are. So with that in mind, moving on to the research, and again, my, my goal isn't necessarily for you to get the takeaways of what, what the research found. It's more like how you approach the research and how we approach research. So I think for this context in particular, this two-step approach would be helpful. And the thing with identity, uh, we were sort of talking about just now, there is so, so many attributes on which you can describe yourself, right? And I think that's why a lot of times people sort of stray away from using identity traits in targeting their customers. Because how do you segment that, right? Like how do you use all these attributes that a single person has in order to segment your market. And so that is how we start our research in consumer behavior uh, in terms of identity, it's these individual differences. But I think the nice thing that research provides for uh, industry and for companies, the use that you can make of it, is that it's not enough for us to simply understand what behaviors people partake in, we need to understand why. 
And in order to understand why, we take that second approach, which is sort of activating an identity or making certain identities salient to people. So you have to sort of be able to say, when I turn this identity on, people behave in this way. When I turn it down, they behave in a different way. So you sort of manipulate the context. So an example of that sort of comes, I think a good example of this is something I work with a lot, which is age. Um, and there's the individual difference in age, right? We're all different ages, so we're all somewhere along the continuum of, of where we stand in life. And that's an individual difference. It's tricky to target people just specific to their age. So how do you activate certain feelings of age, right? So in my work, I, looked at, I look at perceived age. Um, and perceived age is how old you feel, not necessarily how old you are. So if you can imagine me saying, how old do you feel relative to that baby? That's going to be a different answer than if I ask you, how old do you feel relative to that old man? Right? And that's an example of activating an identity. Making it, turning up a certain identity or turning it down. Feeling old, feeling young. And I guess my argument here is that this, is, this second part is what you can use in your companies in, in terms of targeting your customers. It's sort of turning on and turning off these identities. So with that, just a few uh, experiments that have been carried out. And with, for each one, I'd like to sort of go through and talk about that individual difference that's sort of unmanageable and how you then uh, harness that to something that you can't manipulate and take advantage of. So all of these studies do have to do with consumer behavior, so they're related to consumer context. So this study was looking at how people perceive uh, rating distributions. So you can see here, the idea here is that this is kind of a bimodal distribution versus a unimodal distribution. Does that matter? And the hypothesis is that the more you need to self-express, the more you're going to go for products with the bimodal distribution. Sort of goes back to this initial idea we were talking about with distinctiveness, namely that it's a lot easier to say you're distinctive when you're aligned with one group or the other group than if you're sort of like somewhere in the middle. Here, right? So the individual difference here being just like your need for self-expression, and that does vary. <coughs> Uh, adolescents tend to have a much higher need for self-expression in the external sense, just because they haven't clearly defined themselves yet. But again, how do you harness that? One way to do that is to make certain domains feel more self-expressive, right? So I can say, uh, I can talk about these Nike Angry Bird shoes, right? And certain domains will be much more self-expressive with their shoes. So if I'm gardening, mm, not so much. No one can see me. I can't really signal this identity to anyone except myself. Not super meaningful. If I'm at a party, however, those shoes are great at telling people who I am. Uh, so what we did find for, for this is that in contexts that are very self-expressive and for product attributes that are really self-expressive, so something like the style of the product versus the quality of the product, Distributions do make a difference. So how can you use that to your advantage? I guess the takeaway here is you can activate area, you can activate uh, your product to seem more or less self-expressive. So what are the contexts where your product might be used that would seem more self-expressive? What are the contexts where you might use your product that are less self-expressive? Does this make sense for your product? You know, if, it, if it is something that you want people to sort of relate to on their identity level, <coughs> maybe activating more self-expressive context is beneficial. Another example is group identity. Again, people's identities, group identities vary so vastly, it's hard to just hone in on one. So what do you do? You can create your own groups, right? So in this study, what they did is, was this <laughs> study with Live Strong Bracelets, back when Lance Armstrong was a good guy. Um, <laughs> so, what they did is they gave this Live Strong bracelet to a couple of people in the popular dorm at Stanford. And they saw the adoption rate of those bracelets, right? And over a week, just like exponentially, almost everyone had this bracelet. And then a week later, they gave it to the outgroup dorm, so the kind of geeks at Stanford, as much as you can differentiate at Stanford. Um, yeah, um, and so as soon as those bracelets were introduced to the outgroup dorm, the adoption of the in-group dorm, completely went out the door. They right? started taking them off. So to that point, you know, how can you make use of in-groups and out-groups? A lot of times we sort of try to make products that will fit everyone. And in doing so and building something for the average person, you're really not pleasing anyone. So can you identify an in-group and out-group for your product or can you create one? And these can be, it's interesting how quickly people fall into in-groups and out-groups. So even anything as simple as like 
being from the Bay Area versus being from Southern California, being from the East Coast, West Coast. That's up to you. That's an in-group, out-group that you can create. Um, identities, again, <coughs> different people have different identities that are important to them. You can't tap into all of those. So how do you make a certain identity more prominent or more top of mind for people? Uh, so for this study, the identity that was at stake was intelligence. And what they did is they, this is kind of a funny manipulation. Um, I shouldn't use the word manipulation. That's what we use, but that's <laughs> what has, a, has a really negative connotation in other contexts. Um, so what they did was um, they had students to whom intelligence sort of is an important attribute. Um, they had them write about themselves either with their dominant hand or their non-dominant hand. And the idea is that if I'm writing about how great I am with my non-dominant hand, and yet I can't really write, I sort of misattribute that to being like, eh, maybe I'm not so great. And so then their choice was, after, after writing about themselves, they got to choose between something that was like intelligence signaling, so something like the Wall Street Journal, versus something that's more hedonic, we know we all love it, but we don't want to admit it, us weekly. And for people whose identity was sort of put into question, they were more likely to go for the Wall Street Journal something that signaled intelligence. So again, the point here is, yes, for some of us, intelligence is more important or less important, but can you turn it up for everybody? Can you, on average, lift that, the importance of an attribute for all your customers, and how can you do that? So just sort of the insights uh, from, a few insights from, from the research out there. And um, in terms of applying it, um, so these are all sort of hypotheses that I would come up with from identity research, or some of the hypotheses, right? So we know that identity is really important to people. So asking people to personalize their profiles, right? You're tapping into their identity, you're making it important to them, you're all at once getting information from them for your own personal use. Uh, dashboards, people love to keep track of how they're doing, where they stand in life. Uh, so dashboards, as much as you can give people information as to how they're doing, um, and perhaps how they're doing relative to others. Who are the relevant others for these people? Can you tap into that? Um, and with all of this, as I said, these are hypotheses that I have from research that has been done in consumer identity. But I don't know this for sure, right? And that's where the hypothesis testing comes into play. And I feel like, I'm, I'm sure all of you know this, but I can't tell you how many times I've come across people who don't do this. So in order to even look, uh, test hypotheses, you need to identify the relevant metrics, right? And this is actually a really difficult thing to do. And working with a few companies, it's funny, you, you talk to various team members in the company, and you'll say, like, what, what's your metric for success? And every team member will give you a different answer. Uh, what are the consumer behaviors that would lead to your metric of success? Everyone has a different opinion. So I think first step with, with things like that is identifying what is a success metric for you. And second is like, what are those individual, like very specific steps that your consumers have to partake in in order to lead to that uh, success metric? And then from that, sort of taking a hypothesis-driven approach. So as I said, a lot of these things, the, the research I showed you, I, I, I imagine most of you thought that was like pretty intuitive. Of course, that happens. Um, but again, that's not always the case. Humans are exceptional at rationalizing anything. And so you find some sort of correlation in your data, and you're like, oh, I know exactly what happened, right? Whereas if you had made that prediction ahead of time, you, probably, you might have predicted something completely opposite. So with that in mind, I think it's extremely important to have a hypothesis-driven approach to testing your data. Create the hypothesis, test, and see what you find. You end up learning a lot more. And from that, you can actually derive tests that you would have, right? If your prediction isn't matched, what might have gone wrong? Or if it is matched, can you amplify it? Can you make it even bigger? Um, so that's where your intuition test, intuition testing. And that leads me to testing, which again, so obvious. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but it goes wrong all the time. How do you test? Um, so again, first of all, having those relevant measures. Because if the measures aren't relevant, the test is meaningless. And beyond that, it's really isolating variables, right? So if the question is about dashboard versus no dashboard, that is the only thing you should be testing. There should be nothing else on that page that differentiates the two conditions, right? 
Uh, so the, once you find a difference, if you find a difference, the only thing that you can attribute it to is the difference between dashboard versus no dashboard. And again, I know very obvious, and yet so frequently done incorrectly. So whatever it takes, emailing a psychologist, emailing someone, having someone look over your shoulder to test that, to look at that test, is everything else exactly the same except for that variable that you're interested in. So uh, with that, I will conclude because I'm more interested to hear about what you guys are doing and how maybe we can find some solutions for your problems from consumer behavior. So thank you.